How anxious are you about the future of planet Earth? It's a big question and one that apocalyptic films such as the Book of Eli and Legion have enjoyed exploiting with success. February 2011 we'll see the publication of a new book looking at John's Apocalypse, more commonly known as the Bible Book of Revelation. The book called Facing the Darkness, Finding the Light is written by author and broadcaster David Winter, who is here with me this morning. David, why write another book on the Book of Revelation? Well, it's a fair question because there are quite a lot of them. Uh, some look fairly balmy and some of them very academic. This is neither, well, I hope, balmy nor academic. I think the short answer is because Revelation Apocalypse speaks exactly to our age, which is so like the age in which it was, to which it was first addressed. The first century AD, the Christian church was being persecuted. It was addressed to them. They felt under the oppressive weight of uh, the political system, the emperor, the empire. Uh, they were physically persecuted, but they were mentally pressed as well. Uh, it was also an, an enormous age of change. Uh, the empire was everything, the Roman Empire, but they could see that, you know, it's crumbling around the edges. There were huge things going on in the world, very possibly it was written about the time when Vesuvius erupted and the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were destroyed. Uh, first time that that mountain had erupted in 1,500 years. You can imagine how they felt, very like we do when we confront things like the earthquake in Haiti. So they were in an anxious time, wondering what was going to happen in the future. They were not sure about things. And this book was written to tell them that there is an answer, uh, and the answer is in the life in which you're living now. It's not some remote answer. It's, a, it's about God being at work in the world in which you live. You claim in the book that uh, Revelation is an answer to the old theory of why can a good God allow suffering. So how does Revelation answer that question? Well, uh, fundamentally, I mean, you look at the newspapers, you watch the television news, you listen to the radio, the thing that strikes you is that we live in a world that's full of what we might call bad things. I mean, on an average news bulletin, and I worked as a journalist for 30 years, on an average news bulletin there'll be 10 or 12 items, and 11 of them will be bad news. And the ones that aren't bad news are bad news reversed, like a strike finished, or, you know, a, a truce signed in some long-standing battle. So actually, we're very conscious of the fact that most of the things that happen in the world um, outwardly are bad. We're also conscious of the fact that most of the population of the world, even in the modern era, have a pretty hard life. You know, the vast majority of people in the world uh, don't have much money. Uh, va a, a huge majority of the world uh, live on the edge of poverty. Um, and those of us who don't uh, are aware that those things are going on, so they're all around us. We're aware of things like terrorism, uh, the threat of war, uh, nuclear, you know, will Iran get the nuclear bomb? What about North and South Korea and so on? So the people are pretty anxious uh, in, about the tension of the fact that we live in a world in which there are these many bad things. But at the same time, there are good things. So even poor people in southern uh, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, have happy times. They fall in love, they have children, they laugh and sing. So we've got this strange mixture. Uh, what the book of Revelation does is it takes those two elements. It, it takes together the fact that life is good and life is bad. It keeps showing us visions, like dreamlike visions of both uh, good life, bad life. And it doesn't say it's one or the other. It says that life is both, and that in the end, uh, heaven is a bringing together of reality. It's not, you know, what they call it, uh, jam, you know, to put on your bread after you die. It's, it's the bringing together of these two elements. Heaven is, is the bringing together of the, the good and evil, the end of evil and the triumph of good. So, the book of Revelation is a book of hope, for people in times like ours, that's, that's basically what it's about. Okay, and how does that hope express itself in the book of Revelation? Well, in the book of Revelation, and that I've tried to bring out in mind, you get 
this constant series of of scenes, dreamlike visions. I suspect that they'll speak better to modern people, the people I'm writing for now, 21st century people, than they probably did to people in, say, the Victorian era, or the very, you know, the, the rational era that began in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. I think that the modern era, you know, in which we like Tolkien uh, and Harry Potter and films which are about visionary things, they're not, and horrible things, disaster movies, we love them, you know, that, that it, it may speak more powerfully, because what we're led through is a series of visions, now that, and the visions more or less divide, in fact they alternate in the book, um, if you read it you'll see that they really, really do, you'll get a terrible vision, so you get a vision of the four horsemen of the apocalypse on their different coloured horses, plague, war, famine, disaster, you know, riding through the land, it wreaking havoc, and then you cut to a completely different vision. It's like another world, and yet it isn't, because it's sort of on the same stage. So John, the seer, the one who's seeing all this, says, and then I was taken, and I saw this, and what he saw was what I've called the heavenly throne room, and up in in the sort of control tower, as you might say, sits God on his throne, and alongside him, this strange figure, the lamb with the marks of slaughter on him, and it's identified as Jesus. Right in the heart of the control room of the universe is a God of power and a God of meekness, a God who is in control, but a God who also suffers with his people. The Lamb represents the suffering of God, not only our suffering. And surrounding God and the Lamb are the saints and the angels and the prayers being offered and the incense rising from the altar. And then, lo and behold, just as you're thinking, oh, well, that's all great, isn't it? We're back with the, the beast from the pit and locusts with human faces pouring out from this bottomless pit, wreaking havoc again. Natural disaster. Um, mountains exploding. So, and, but then when you've, when you've seen that, and that's awful, and, and the sea turns red and so on, we're back in the heavenly throne room again. And God on his throne, and next to him, the Lamb. And you, you learn that the Lamb has got some power. He's got a scroll that contains the story of the world in his hands and he's, he can open it. Nobody else can. And so we realise that actually things aren't out of control. Uh, that this is the same world as the one that's suffering. And you have a series of all these. They go on and on and on. And then eventually the, uh, these wonderful visions culminate in a final vision which is the bringing together um, of everything in the new Jerusalem. In the new Jerusalem what is evil has been done away, uh, we find out that in the end God's purpose is uh, that there will be uh, mercy, justice, love, uh, that the lamb is the lamb upon the throne, uh, that the, the crucified lamb is actually King of kings and Lord of lords, we know it from the Messiah. You know. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. So you have this wonderful picture at the end, and you realise that this is for everybody. The final vision is universal. The nations bring their, their glories into the city, and it's a beautiful city. This is a city, it's got a wall around it, to keep evil out, but the gates are open. They're open day and night. Anybody can come in and go out. And the last word of the whole book of Apocalypse, the Revelation, this scary, scary book is, anybody who wants, wants to can come and drink the waters of, of life. Anyone mm. is welcome. So right at the end there's this final invitation, come on, come on in, drink the water. So it, I think it's a, it's a fascinating, exciting, scary, encouraging, brilliantly inspiring book, actually. I guess the um, images that most people will identify from 
with from the Book of Revelation are 666, the yes. Book of the Beast, Armageddon, etc. Mm. The Antichrist. Mm. Who is the Antichrist? Then? Well, that's intriguing because as, uh, what most people know is 666, mm. the sign of the beast. Uh, the great thing is we do know what that is. Um, because uh, this is a game played with numbers and letters. Uh, most of us know that Roman numerals aren't numbers, they're letters. You know, X, X, 1, V and so on. Well, when you translate uh, 666, so it's called gematria, into letters, uh, and then you do the same translation into Aramaic, the language that you know, the, the Jews used at the time, you actually get Nero Caesar. So the beast is actually the emperor. Uh, and Babylon, which is referred to all the way through, the great Babylon is the, the, the evil whore. You know, this is the wicked kingdom. It's Rome. So it's Rome and it's emperor that they, this is the coded language, because that was the element of persecution that was going on. And it was the all-powerful empire. It looked like Rome would be forever, but... Apocalypse is night's not. Its days are up, you know, its days will end. But if that were all it were about, then we could have thrown that book away when the Roman Empire collapsed in the fifth, six centuries. But no, of course not. Because there's always another one. There's always another source of, you know, power in the world. That's political power, then the revelation also has a go at commercial power. There's a whole brilliant chapter on the exploitation of people by commerce mm -hmm. that they will even sell people's lives uh, to make money you know uh, and so you see all the different powers that are still there so okay apocalypse revelation is a judgment of wall street the city of london you know the uh, the hang sang it's 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 all those powers that we've seen what they can do to us in recent years it, but it's a judgment of the of those who want military power, who want to uh, dominate the world. It's a judgment of those who want to exploit other people. It's a, it's a book that takes life as it is and says it all comes under the judgment of God. And But out of that judgment will come good, not bad. Okay. You've said we're in an anxious age. If you could put in to one sentence a message to the people out there today who are living in anxiety from the book of Revelation, what would that one sentence or two sentences be? Well, I suppose that God is still on the throne. Uh, the book of Revelation was a tremendous help to Christians in China during the time of the Cultural Revolution, uh, when they were being persecuted. And uh, there was a great book that meant a great deal to them. In English, the title was The Lamb Upon the Throne. And that's Revelation. Now, isn't it interesting of all the things in the Bible that they looked to, for, to to sustain them? It was this notion that it isn't actually out of control. And that the because life is, as we know it is, it's a mixture of joy and sorrow, of pain and triumph, of good and evil. It really is. The, the life we live now is that. But that that will eventually be subsumed into the kingdom of God. It's, it's okay, God knows, this is how it is. And that God himself, through Jesus, has experienced those things as well. They're a wonderful mix. Thank you very much, David Winter. Uh, Facing the Darkness, Finding the Light is published in February 2011 by BRF, price 6 99 To find out more, log on to www.brfonline.com dot org dot uk